Hey everyone, and welcome to our live. We appreciate you joining us. Let us know where you're checking in from. I have James in the room with me. James, give a quick little shout. Hey everybody. Okay, he's a little bit uh, off in the distance, but Jennifer Deere is here. Hey Jen. Hello. Hey, and she still has a smile on her face. Yesterday was Valentine's Day, so she got chocolate and flowers, didn't you? I did. Okay, luckily my son dragged me out to get stuff for his girlfriend, which prompted me to do the same. So thanks, James, for that. I appreciate it. Okay, he's not even listening right now. But anyways, I hope you all had a very, very happy uh, Valentine's and we wish you guys the best. We are going to do a digitized live. Uh, we got people from all over the place. Uh, Tom from Ontario, Canada, Susan from Ontario as well. Lots of people from Ontario, which that is my original stomping ground. Virginia Beach is uh, sunny and Pamela from uh, Branch, Mississippi, and uh, Gwen from Harrow, Oklahoma. So we got people checking in from all over the place. So we just love this uh, community, and we appreciate you guys checking in. Uh, Jennifer, do you have any announcements that you want to make right off the bat? Not uh, really? Okay. Happy Valentine's. Okay, <laughs> nah, maybe not. Okay. Well, what I was going to say is this is going to be a digitized live. So I am going to digitize a design live, and it's it's going to be a pretty uh, quick design. I'm not going to go into a ton of the theory, but my idea was I'm going to answer any questions you might have. So as I'm digitizing, if you have questions regarding digitizing embroidery, pretty much anything obviously around the, uh, the embroidery, I guess, uh, you know, terms or so to speak, then just feel free to ask them. Jennifer is going to, um, I guess, give them to me as I'm digitizing. And my plan is to prove that I can do more than one thing at a time, maybe. Okay, Jennifer's the laughing. The proof is in the stitching. <laughs> <laughs> the proof is in the stitching. So awesome. So that's what we're going to do. But before we actually do that, I just want everybody to know that Hatch Embroidery, uh, we are an official uh, reseller for Hatch. Hatch has a sale going on right now, uh, started just before Valentine's, but it is actually happening until the 20th of February and they have $200 off of their digitizing program. And you get all of the incredible added value that Hatch uh, provides. They have over 200 lessons within their uh, Hatch Academy now. And if you do support us as your official reseller, what we do is we kind of sweeten the pie a little bit. We give you all the great value that is uh, you know, given through directly by Hatch, but we also include some of our exclusive bonuses which includes the first level of our dream course, which is a interactive hands-on course on how to digitize. We go through all three stitch types and we have multiple projects uh, on each, I guess, stitch type. And the idea is you go through all of the lessons, there's four lessons, and then there's a certification lesson for each of the levels. And then we also have a three month membership of our uh, embroidery club which gives you a bunch of extras as far as designs or fonts, because we do actually have, I think, almost a thousand ESA fonts. Those are fonts specifically for the Hatch or Wilcom platform. So we have extra fonts that you can choose from. And we also have eight hours of education that I did many, many years ago. It's kind of the, the foundational education that I taught. How long ago did I do that, Jim? I mean, if you see the picture of me teaching, because I do come up on camera, I was much younger, You're no lines. What's that? You're a baby. <laughs> I was a baby. Yeah, there was no lines in my forehead. My hair was dark uh, brown. So anyways, it was a long time ago. But the amazing thing with regards to embroidery and digitizing is even though the software has changed, the machines have changed, the theory on how to create designs, the I guess the, the basics, they have for the most part stayed almost exactly the same. The stuff that I taught 25, 30 years ago, and I have been teaching for a long time, those foundational things are still the same. And they, they're the same from when I learned them, when I was 17. And I started on a pantograph, one stitch at a time, on a board-based system. So uh, things have changed, but the foundation has not changed. So that is something that uh, Hatch has on sale right now. A if great you've been, price. It is a great price, $200 mm -hmm. off. And uh, again, if you decide to purchase and you you choose to support us we'll give you some free extra bonuses and all you have to do is click through our link on our site and then that actually takes you directly to Hatch's site to purchase the uh, I guess the the link is kind of in, encrypted so that they know that you're coming through us 
all of the payments, everything still goes through Hatch. And then they notify us within a few days that the purchase has been made. And then we release the bonuses. Right, Jen? Correct. That's the way it happens. So anyways, uh, and uh, a great program. Just so you know, I have been using a Wilcom program for well over three decades. And I've been involved with Hatch, which is their uh, you know home system. They have a commercial platform and a home platform. And I have been involved with it since the very beginning. And I am very uh, thankful to Wilcom for including me uh, within this. And it's been a, uh, a great relationship because I, I love the software and I'm very familiar with it. And it does pretty much have, I would say, 90% of the same tools that are in my commercial software, which is a lot more expensive. Most of those tools are there. Uh, they're just kind of arranged differently. I wouldn't say watered down, but they fine tune the property. So there's not as many choices, but the choice that they give you is actually the choice that I use majority of the time. And uh, they actually uh, have given you a platform that gives you the same EMD format that the commercial software does and the same hotkeys that the commercial software has. So I've, I've said for years, I, I'm just as fast on Hatch as I am my E4 platform, which is the commercial platform. And the quality of my designs is pretty much exactly the same. So there is very little difference in that aspect. Um, so anyways, I'm going to show you Just what we... Just a quick we, question. Yep, Somebody sure. says, what about bonuses if they're using the flex pay, which is the monthly payment? Uh, the flex pay, we do. If you choose us as your reseller, we do have bonuses for whatever level you uh, choose to purchase, whether it is the... Uh, you know, composer level, whether it is the editing level, because Hatch is modular. You don't have to buy the digitizer. Uh, you can buy a lower version and then move up based on your uh, needs and your experience. And any level that they offer, if you choose us as a reseller, we do have specific bonuses for that level, including the FlexPay. Yes. So but, the FlexPay, uh, some of it's released right away and some yes. of it we hold off until the end until of the, the end of the last payment. Not everybody could, completes the. Yeah. Not, unfortunately, not everybody com completes all of the payments, uh, which they lose the software. And obviously, some of the things that we release are based on when somebody completes their purchase. Correct. So For that's Flex awesome. Pay. Yeah. OK, perfect. Any other questions, Jennifer, dear? Uh, not yet. Not yet. OK, but. Uh, keep them rolling in, guys, because uh, as we have the questions come up, I will do my best to answer them while I'm digitizing. Do you Jenna, want me to just raise my hand when we have uh, Sure, or just interrupt me. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll be talking. But me? You're, yeah, you're pretty good at interrupting me. I've, I've noticed that you can do that once or twice. Uh, okay, I, I just wish Jennifer would come on camera a couple times, because if you could see her facial expressions with the things that I say, I I'm think it, sure would, they can imagine. It, it, it would make the show so much better. So, no, not happening. Okay, I'm, I'm working on it, guys. It's been three years of me working on it so far. So this is the simple design that we're going to digitize live. And I'm going to take you into the Hatch program now. And we will close this one up. And we will get this one in. So here is the software I'm going to make. Actually, here's the thing. If you don't like the views that we have here, uh, let me know. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch cameras so that I have an over-the-shoulder view as well. Now, if you, and maybe we can get people to comment, but if this view is all right for you, let me know. Or would you rather my hand be smaller? Actually, it might be better if the screen's a little bit bigger that you're actually seeing. You can just see my hand movement. Uh, so anyways, this is the design that we're going to be doing. And give me one second, guys, to just get the software up where I can see it. Okay, so here I am. I'm going to go into my software now, and I'm going to tell it to zoom in to 600%. That's a zoom factor. And this is the scale that I generally digitize at 99% of the time. Actually, no, 90% of the time. Sometimes I do digitize at 300%, which looks like this. But those are the two scales that I toggle between all the time. And that's because I am a big advocate of seeing on screen consistently. It makes you a better digitizer. And working at six to one also makes you faster for the most part because um, you don't have to worry that you are as accurate as you might think you need to be. I'm going to choose a different color on here. I'm going to do a fill stitch. So I'll just come in here right now and I'll do a fill and it panned over a little bit, but I brought it back onto screen and I'm just going to come right over here and outline this fill as I move around. And when I get back to the beginning, because it will automatically close the shape, I'm just going to hit that enter button 
and there my fill is closed. If I hit the T key, it'll give me the true view so you can kind of see what I just created. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to travel over here. So I'm going to go to a run stitch and I'm going to go right from this point here and I'm going to travel with a tiny little stitch up over to here because I don't want any trims or you know jumps to be registered. And that way when I start my next point, because they are connecting and the software generally does join closest point, it will actually uh, you know, not cause any trims. It's going to automatically connect where I want it to. So join closest point is another feature that is a lifesaver because you don't have to think as much when you're actually creating designs. Now I'm going to come right over here and then I'm going to close this shape. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to go over to a run stitch and I'm going to go into my next little piece here. And then I'm going to go back to my digitize close shape. I'm going to do another fill stitch. And if you can kind of see where I am with, and I, I know that this is live, so I can't necessarily highlight my, my pointer as I'm going, but I am going about halfway between that uh, column that is outlining. There's a thick column there. It's about two and a half millimeters, maybe, maybe 2.2 millimeters. How do I know it's about 2.2 millimeters? Uh, because I digitized that six to one and I have for the last 38 years. So I kind of got that part figured out. So I have all of my pieces now in place. And what I'm going to do is right now I'm going to grab all three of these. So I'm going to highlight them and I'm going to actually turn off the true view because you can see they're highlighted when they turn purple. You can't actually see that when you are in uh, your true view mode, which is in embroidery simulated mode. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change all of these properties at once. But before I do that, unfortunately, I have to go into metric. So I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to go into my metric and let's escape here for a second. And I need to go from US to metric. I had it set up in uh, US when I was choosing the size of the design, but for your actual uh, properties, you always want to go metric because everything works better in tenths when it comes to properties and digitizing. I'm going to turn off all of my underlay. I'm going to then grab all of those pieces, go back to my uh, stitches and I have travel on edge and I didn't tell you this at the beginning but I am going to do all of these pieces as a mylar design so I'm going to have mylar I'm going to hit the H key which is going to allow me to change the angle and I'm going to change the angle of all of these so that they are kind of going in the direction of each of the leaves so I'll grab the next one here and let's just grab this one and I'll grab this one and I'm going to change the direction, grab the little handle for the angle. We'll make that one this direction and let's turn on the true view so you can actually see that. And then I'll grab the last one right down here and let's take that one and change the direction as well. So I've now changed the direction of all three of those and that color for the most part is actually done. So let's just escape out of there. And now I can go back to my select tool and I am ready to start my next color. Turn off the true view. That first piece is done. And now I'm gonna choose a darker color. Any questions so far, Jennifer? We or? do have a few questions, okay. yes. So give me a couple questions. Actually, I'll tell you when, because what I'm gonna do right now is I'm just going to start doing the next color. So I, choose, I chose a darker color. I'm gonna choose my digitized open shape. I'm going to choose a, I'm gonna choose a stem stitch. I'm going to keep the width at, uh, let's say, two millimeters and do three passes. And I'm going to change the stitch angle to about 60 degrees so that it's not quite as, I guess, angled as it would normally be. So it's kind of almost becoming a little, uh, the inclination points are becoming a little bit straighter. And now I can start to create an object. And I'm just going to come right here and put this down. As soon as I do the first one, then I'll start answering some questions. And let's create this one right to here and hit enter. And I need to grab that and make it a darker color. And oops, oh, you know what? It changed it all back to what it was. So I'm going to I'm going to change that afterwards. I'll do all the angles at the same time. But let's turn this on to true view just so you can see it. And there's my first piece. OK, go ahead and ask the questions, Jen. OK. Could you explain a little bit as to round versus square nodes when Oops. you would use each one, how it would be helpful? Okay, a round versus a square node. Uh, the round nodes are curved, and that is usually a, 
uh, right click on, sorry, uh, straight is, or sorry, curve is a left click. Uh, the uh, straight is a left click. Okay, hold on. L let me show you right here. I, I If I do a, a left click, it is straight. And if I do a right click, it becomes curved. So I can go between straight and curve with my left and right clicks. So by doing that, when I turn it into a point, you can see that these are squares. They're little yellow squares, which indicates that that is your left click. And the curves are actually turquoise circles. So when I go to edit these and I move them, that will remain a circle. But when I have the node highlighted, if I ever hit the space bar, it will toggle it between, and I'll turn on the true view, it'll toggle it between a curve and straight. So you can choose all of your nodes based on whether you want to do a straight line or whether you want to do a curve line. And I'll just get rid of that object altogether now, and I'll just keep going on. Next question, my dear. Uh, Sonny is asking, you said to go to metric at which point? Uh, after I've sized my artwork. Okay. So once my artwork has been sized, that is usually when I will go to uh, metric. Okay. Can you uh, discuss a bit about when do you not need a travel stitch? Uh, when objects are connecting. So if I actually have objects that are connecting, then I don't necessarily need a travel. Like here, I'm going to go all the way down to this point right here, and I'm going to enter it. And I got to figure out how to get this to stay on the right color. Uh, but here you can see that I have this point here, but the space between here and here is a little bit too long. So I'll still need to have a connecting stitch between these. Um, that is, you know, if, if it's close enough, then I don't need to actually travel. But if it's far, so if I want to go from here to here, I still might want to have a traveling stitch in between those which will look something like that as far as a traveling stitch is concerned. So it's just a long point from one to the next. Next question. Uh, why does the closest join not always work with lettering? Uh, it should for the most part. Uh, can you, I, I guess if it's an ESA font, if the font was actually digitized for uh, an ESA file, then it should actually work with that. So you should not have to, and I'm, I don't know why this isn't staying. It's not staying on my feature here. Okay, let's try this. Sorry, just thinking out loud here. Uh, but if it is an ESA font, when the ESA fonts are created, you do have the option within the software to choose, there we go, now it's working, to choose a, a join closest point. And if the person who created the ESA font did not Put the right settings in that's when you're going to have issues of things not joining um, the other problem is a lot of times people will take a true type font and they will auto digitize a true type font and then wonder why it isn't behaving like the other esa fonts and that's because you'll always get better results from a true esa font that was digitized by a digitizer who hopefully knows what they're doing because any font will only turn out as well as the person who programmed the font in the first place. So anybody can make a font, but that doesn't mean that they are qualified to, unfortunately. Next question. Uh, Jan is asking, hi Jan. Uh, when I save a design that I've digitized in Hatch and I try to save the EMB file, how do I get it to save into the program? It sends it to other places and it shows a square with an X and says it was not saved. Okay, that's a little bit of a mystery to me. Actually, I honestly am not sure at this point. Uh, I've never had that happen. Uh, that would be probably a hatch support question because if you save an EMB file, uh, Read that to me one more time. Sure. She says when she saves the design that she's digitized in Hatch mm -hmm. and she tries to save the EMB file, uh, it sends it to another place and it shows a square with an X and says it was not saved. Okay. Yeah. I have never had that happen. So uh, I'm honestly, I, I, I'm, I don't know because that is not normal. Okay. Maybe the path in which it's being saved to, but I honestly 
don't know the answer to that one, unfortunately. Okay, so Jan, if you want to maybe message into Hatch Support and see if maybe it's uh, something within your software glitch, possibly. Uh, Brenda is asking, can you talk a little bit about the process of using a drawing pad while you're digitizing? She has a Wacom uh, that she got for Valentine's, nice gift, and she's only been able to get it hooked up. Okay, uh, it would be nice to know if she is talking specifically about a Wacom uh, tablet or a Wacom monitor, because there is a big difference between a, a tablet and an actual monitor. A tablet is a piece of hardware that kind of looks like a mouse for the most part, and you plug it in by USB, and then what happens is it gives you a pen, but your pen is uh, drawing on a pad. It's not necessarily drawing right on the, uh, actually, I'm going to keep that one joining closest point. It's not necessarily drawing, uh, you know, on the monitor. The Wacom Cintiqs, which that is the uh, model that actually allows you to draw on a monitor, that one you do need to usually uh, plug in, load the drivers in the software, and depending on your PC, and they do work with Macs as well, but depending on your actual computer, you may need to configure and calibrate your screens properly. Uh, so that it is, you know, working in the right way and your, your pen isn't in a different area than where, you know, your lines are being drawn half an inch off of where your pen is. And that can get a little frustrating. So um, I, I personally like the monitors much better than the tablets, but I like the tablets much better than I like a mouse. So there is lots of different options and lots of different uh, hardware that has come down dramatically in price. I know there's on our website within our Amazon links, and I'm pretty sure they're sold out. And I, I'd like to think that we maybe are part of the reason why they're sold out, but we had a 22-inch uh, monitor that is made by a company called uh, Artus, Artisol, I believe it is. And I found those monitors and started to play with, I bought one and I, I play with it and that's what I do all my recording on. And I think it was like $400, uh, like $360, something like that for a 21 inch tablet monitor, which is incredibly reasonable because the same monitor by Wacom, which is kind of like the leading brand in the industry, you are buying great quality, but they are probably like four or five times the price. So do your homework, do some shopping. We have put some, I guess, products that we do kind of endorse a little bit because I, I have tried them. Uh, I have, how many monitors do I have, Jennifer? Too many. <laughs> there we go. So yeah, but I have to because I have to test them. I mean, you know, we need to make sure that what we're showing people. And he needs to test a lot of stuff over here. Well, I do actually. So, and okay. please, if you agree with me, give me some hearts or thumbs up that I need to test a bunch of equipment. So Jennifer will get off my back when the when the uh, the Artisol twenty two inch uh, is two eighty nine. Two eighty nine. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Christine. And that that is a fantastic price. I mean, crazy good price. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, one of the next questions is: You recently changed the stitch width when digitizing. How does one know what that stitch width should be? Uh, I, I would just have to say from experience, and that's where uh, digitizing at a set scale, and again, uh, the six to one scale that I teach in all of my videos was taught to me. I, I will not say to people that I invented uh, the art of digitizing or punching. I absolutely did not. I was trained by a Shifley puncher who trained in Switzerland as a young man. And he taught me the foundational things. The difference in those days, because we didn't have computers, we had big panogram, like uh, big looms that had a panograph on the side of it. And we were uh, actually punching at a six to one scale. So the artwork was drawn 
six times larger under an overhead camera because there were no plotters and printers 50 years ago, but it was drawn on an overhead projector or camera using a pencil and ruler. And then that draft was tacked onto the panograph and you proceeded to punch. So this whole theory that I teach of digitizing at a set scale has been around for like now it's got to be 140 or 150 years since you know embroidery has been mechanically being reproduced so it it helps you to be able to see lines on the screen and i can know just by looking at a line on a screen at six to one if it is half a millimeter one millimeter two millimeters three millimeters and then because i can visually you know gauge exactly what it is just by looking at it because of the consistency then i know from experience what i need to input within my properties and it does not take that long a lot of people you know say well how long does it take to digitize at a six to one scale and kind of get used to it well like anything the more you do the better you get so yes it does take time but it is a matter of months not years for that initial thing to kind of click and that's and, our three levels of digitizers yeah, exactly. uh, dream workshop. Uh, and if some of you have completed that and you're watching and you know you agree with what I've been saying, then give me some thumbs up or hearts or comments because you know that foundational theory which I was taught uh, is, in my opinion, the most important information for learning how to create designs because it does cross over into every software program, not just Hatch, but if you own, you know, Floriani or Stitch Artist or Bernina or Janome, whatever software you have, if you have the foundation, the learning curve is greatly reduced. Or if you're a machine watcher. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to change this to 60 degrees now all at the same time. And I'm going to turn on the true. Well, I can't do it now. But if you look here, this was the old 45 degree. So that's what 45 looked at looked like. I just changed it to 60 and it just kind of uh, changed the angle a little bit. And I think that's going to give me a better result. So right now what I've done is I have completed all of those little uh, inside areas with a stem stitch, which I think is going to look pretty cool. Now this is where uh, hatch does give you the ability to cheat a little bit. And I do love to cheat, meaning that I can choose a satin stitch. I can, let's make this, uh, I'm going to go 2.2 millimeters wide because that's what I think it looks like on screen. So I'm being pretty exact here, 2.2 uh, millimeters wide. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to digitize all of these little objects around the outside. And then I'm going to use the branching tool within the software. And it does a fantastic job. So normally, if I were teaching kind of the old school way, I would be telling people how to path properly. I'm going to cheat here a little bit and still get good results. Sorry, before you jump on yep. that, just because this is uh, goes with what you're just finished. Are you using round nodes for the stem stitch on that design? Yes. Uh, yes, I was. I was using round nodes. But when I got right into here, and I will zoom in on this a little bit. So let me go in and zoom with my, let's get out of that. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Uh, give you an idea. Right here on this one object, if I hit that H key, you can see that I used a started off on this side up here with a straight node. And then all of the areas here that go all the way around this until I get to this point, that is curves until here. Because if I change that to a curve, then it's going to give me, it doesn't really matter that much with the stitch type, but it's always curved straight. And then uh, I went back to a curve and I finished off over here with a straight. I could have probably finished with a curve, but that's just habit and repetition. You will find that when you're digitizing point counterpoint. I talk, I talk about it kind of like when people are climbing a ladder and uh, when and I give you an example and I'll just change this screen for a second. When people are doing point counterpoint stitches to control widths. And when I teach my education, I always tell people it's like climbing a ladder. You want to put hand, 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 hand. And as you're going up each step of the ladder, that bar that crosses is kind of that inclination mark. So if your ladder starts to curve a little bit, then you know that you're going to start, you know, doing one of these, but it, it's all repetition. And I get people almost like drumming. When I train them in classes, I say, think of a drum, 
beat, beat, beat. You want to always have the consistent beat. If you have two beats in the same time, which is two points, it might give you a strange thing happening on screen. And that's one thing that I love when I see people learning, especially in a, in a live class. They'll say, I don't know what happened because they have what I like to call a stitch explosion on screen. You've probably experienced one of those if you've tried to digitize, but you get this funky stitches going all over the place like, like fireworks with stitches. And it's usually because you put in a wrong node or sets of nodes in the wrong order. So go ahead. Anything else, Jennifer, or should I go back? Uh, I can keep asking questions. Okay, keep asking it. and I'll, I'll just continue now and let me get back to where I was. Because as you know, we've already proven that it's very hard for me to do more than one thing at a time. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> Sorry, what was that, Jen? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go six to one, and now I'm going to just continue on. I am trying to digitize with the TrueView on, just so you guys can see the screen. Normally, I would not have the TrueView on. I'd normally digitize like this, because it's a little easier for me to visually see. But I will do it with the TrueView on, so you get a better, better visual effect. Go ahead, Jennifer. Okay. Um, Monique says her closest join does not work when she follows the classes, even though she has it selected. She usually has to go back and change the starts and stops. Do you have any suggestions? Mm, is the uh, just to make sure that everything touches as it joins, because the, it'll only join closest point if the objects that you are creating are actually touching each other. Now that is, I was off on that. I'm gonna change that a little bit. So it might be, I doubt very much that it is a software thing. I'm, I'd probably peg it on user error just because I do know the Wilcom platform uh, like the back of my hand. So if you do make sure, like if here, let's put it this way, for this object here, I, st I started here and I stopped here. So I have a start point right at the bottom where the base is, where all three pedals are. And the little red dot is actually at the outside over here. Now I know that if I have the join closest point on, when I do the next object, and I'll just go back here, if I do this one, let's turn the tree view off for a second, and I start here and I'm going around the center of the object, if I go all the way around this side, and I know that when I come right to here, I know these stitches are going to touch that first object that I created. And because they touch, I know the join closest point will become active. So when I do this, it's going to end up doing something like this. And I know that it will travel then without that. And I shouldn't have any issues. So it's just one of those, one of those things that you get used to it and you shouldn't have to change that too much afterwards. Next question. Uh, could you not create one clover leaf and copy and paste it? Uh, you could, but what fun would that be? <laughs> <laughs> now you, you, you could, but I think the leaves are all slightly different. So, you know, the leaves are going to be slightly different, each one of them. So I, I probably would want to follow the artwork closer than trying to make the design perfectly symmetrical. Especially, I mean, we're talking about digitizing a clover that nobody's going to judge because it's, you know, my artwork and I'm going to give it away to you guys free. Oops, did I just say that? Okay, but, you know, nobody's going to complain about it. But if this were a corporate logo and we were digitizing for a business, you know, that is a totally different story because they want their artwork to look exactly the way it should look. Yeah. We remember those people, Jennifer? I do, yes. <laughs> we did that for many, many years, corporate or you know, cus uh, contract digitizing. We were a punch house for many years. And Jennifer handled all the customers and took the orders. I did. <laughs> oh, I did something wrong there. Oh, no, you know, I'm going to keep going. Normally, I would do the centerpiece first, but I'm not going to because we're going to use the branching tool. Go ahead. Uh, Monique says she has a 24-inch uh, Huey on. It does not work with her hatch through the parallels. Could you make a video on how to connect windows through parallels? Uh, the site says uh, it's compatible with Windows or Mac. That would be maybe a James question, but we don't have uh, Yui on here because James is the only person in our office on Mac. Uh, unfortunately, the and Leanne. Oh, yeah, and Leanne. I can ask Leanne. I, I have to see what I bought her. 
Yeah, it, it, we, we could only do a video like that if we had the exact same identical equipment, because especially in the world of when you start mix and matching hardware components with Max, it's easier because they kind of are more uniform, but in the Windows world, it can be a little problematic because there's so many different variables. But we will we'll try to see if we can figure something out. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do really quickly. I'm going to take all of those objects and uh, let's just actually come here. You know, I might have to do this one at a time. That one's two. Okay, so this one, two, 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 two. Oops. I already changed the first one. So I'm going to change all of these to two millimeters. So they are the same as the first one that I did. Hit enter. Now they're a little bit thinner. And now I'm going to select all of those and I'm going to tell the software, if you look at the kind of jumps and trims all over the place, I'm going to tell the software to branch it. And I'm going to start right here on this object and I'm going to end down at the bottom, oops, right over here. So it finishes at the bottom. Now, one thing I will show you just so that you can see this is when I finished at the bottom, I did not finish right and let's hold to get rid of the artwork display i did not finish right at the very tip or the end of the stem whenever i choose an end point within digitizing i always choose an end point a couple stitches up from the end of a design because a lot of times when it goes down and comes back up a couple stitches that tie out will disappear but the tie out will become very visual if you don't tie out into a satin, if you tie it at the end of a satin stitch, it becomes much more visual. So there is our design. The only thing I have to do now is choose a different color. And I'm going to come in here and I could probably just do this at three to one. Any more questions, Jen? Uh, with a commercial machine, is there an advantage to getting Studio 4? Uh, I would, I would actually, I don't think they have a demo version, but... I know that I could digitize pretty much 95, if not more percent of my designs with Hatch. Uh, do I use my E4 software? Yes, because I've owned it for so long, but uh, I could do most of the things. The thing that the E4 does offer you is more property control, which most people don't really know how to use uh, efficiently, but if you're willing to learn, it is there. Uh, and the other things, it does have commercial formats it has uh, commercial features for like doing name drops much easier, setting up, uh, you know, templates. Uh, there are some other, you know, specialty tools that are involved, but you need to make a, an educated decision and probably get a demo uh, from the company that is selling you that, that program to make sure that it justifies the added cost. So, you know, I think that the Hatch software is incredibly powerful for the price point. And a lot of people don't necessarily need to have anything more powerful, but there's a difference between needs and wants, right? Uh -huh. I mean, if you're the type of person that just wants the best and the commercial platform, then by all means, if it's going to make you happy, go for it. It's kind of like shopping on Amazon. Do you need every monitor that's made out there? Probably not because, uh, you know, it might not be wise and your wife will yell at you, but, uh, you know, but is you need it? it. If you need it, which I do justify that I do, then yeah, I'm going to buy it and I probably won't tell Jennifer and I'll, I'll face the music afterwards. Huh. <laughs> okay. If anybody has any more questions, feel free to send them along. Okay. Now, if you wonder what I'm doing now, I'm just taking a run stitch and I'm doing a run stitch all the way around these uh, petals, these leaves. I guess they're not petals, they actually are leaves, but I'm doing a run stitch and this run stitch is on top of everything and I'm going pretty much right in the middle. I'm still at my six to one scale. And again, I could do this at three to one and see the entire screen. One thing I do love about uh, the Hatch platform and the commercial Wilcom platform is their auto pan feature. It does allow me to, you know, once I get used to it, it really does smoothly, you know, move around a design. So there is my object. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that object and duplicate it. And I'm going to take the second color and make it a different color. So now I have two objects. And this is because I'm going to move these right up to the very beginning. If I want this to be a mylar design, 
I want to get rid of the background. I want to go to the player and I need an outline first so I can actually show where the design is going to be. And then after the outline is done, and I'll speed this up in a second, after the outline is done, then it's going to do the tack down. So I would lay down my mylar and then I would tape it in place and then I'd have this tack down stitch go over top of it. That's going to hold the mylar in place. And then it's going to do the very loose 1.2 millimeter edge run fill, changing the angles. It'll actually catch the direction of the, the, you know, the mylar, the light will hit it in different directions. It's going to look pretty cool. And then we have all of our pieces. It all uh, goes together without any jumps or trims. And then, yes, I did use all of the uh, uh, branching tools. So I did cheat a little bit and I branched this using the branching tool. If I were to have done this the traditional way, I would have gone in there and put a little bit more thought process into how I was joining all of those pieces together. I love the branching tool, but one little key that I will give you is the branching tool is best used with little pieces at a time, bite-sized chunks. So an, a design that is this size is not really an issue because it's going to do everything. It's going to line up fine and there's going to be no registration issues. But even if I, if I were doing like a tree that had a trunk and a whole bunch of branches, like a whole bunch of branches, if I did that entire tree for the back of a jacket and then use the branching tool and branch everything at once, you might run into or you probably will run into issues because it's going to look at that entire piece and start putting underlay down first for everything and then start putting the satin stitches. And if you have too much detail where the underlay is going down first and then trying to finish it up, it might line up perfectly at the very beginning, but as you get deeper into the design, as you get deeper into the roots of the design, tree, get it, pun, okay. But that's going to start having registration issues and you might start seeing underlay pop out in certain areas. So I do use a branching tool, but I usually use it in little chunks of a design as I move around so that I don't get too far ahead of myself. Doug was asking if you could do a little demo with the branching tool. Uh, I can, there's the design finished just so you know, but let's do a quick little demo. I'll go back into my six to one scale. I'm going to come into my point counterpoint and I will choose the brown just so you can see, but I'm going to make a tree. And this is what I love about this is I can do a branch. Oops, actually that is not a good tree because it was with a running stitch. Let's back up and say that I didn't do that. And let's choose a satin stitch instead, instead of a run. But there is one branch there. Then I'm gonna do another branch over here. So here's a little branch over here. And then I'm gonna do another branch over here. And let's just have this branch go off of this one. And let's do one over here off of this one. And then I'll do another branch over here. And you can kind of get the uh, idea that I'm just basically going around creating random pieces that are all going to join together eventually. Now this kind of looks cool on screen, but the problem is as I'm creating this, and if I turn the true view off, uh, you're gonna see that I have all of these little trims and jumps. So that's going to literally sew out in a whole bunch of pieces. And let's do one more big piece that's gonna join these all together like this. Do you and pop that up on the big screen? Yep, let's do it on the big screen. Let me get, let's try that. Okay, so there's all of my little pieces right there. And if I turn the true view off, you're gonna see there's all of these little jumps and trims. And I'll try to zoom into this just so you can see. So you see all those lines, those are jumps and trims. So if I select that object, which you can see I did right now, and I hit the branching tool, when I hit branching in the bottom, I guess, left-hand corner of the screen, it says enter entry point. So I'm gonna say, well, I'm gonna start right here and I'm gonna hit once and then it says enter exit point. And I'm gonna exit at the very bottom of the thick part of the trunk, but I'm not gonna do it at the very end, not right down here. I'm gonna go up two stitches and that way it's going to tie out right there. Now, if I look at this now, let's just go back to the, the, the view. This is now branched. And I can tell because all the pieces are together. When I undo it, I actually have a whole bunch of different pieces. If I go down in my sequence, there's all of these little pieces 
that are individually done with all of those jumps and trims all over the place. And when I go and branch it, you can see that it's all branched into one piece and there's absolutely no jumps or trims in the design. So it is an incredibly powerful tool within the software to create designs. Okay. Next question. We have a few questions, so I'm gonna to try to roll them up into one or two asks, so maybe okay. you can explain it. Uh, does the hatch branching tool work the same as within the design doodler branching tool? And what is the difference between hatch and the design doodler? Uh, the, okay, the, the design doodler does have a branching tool. It is uh, at this point, not quite as advanced in that you need to have the same width and the same stitch type and it will branch everything uniformly. Uh, it works really well for its, in, in my opinion, the intended purpose, which is sketch work designs. Uh, so there is, uh, there's a branching tool in both. Uh, the Wilcom software does have branching and red work, which is a branching function that gives you exactly two passes. That is not available in the Doodler. And the big difference between the Doodler and Hatch is uh, one is a digitizing program and it does editing and it does lettering and it is for doing artistic stuff and it's for doing corporate designs because you can be as precise as you want. The Doodler is a program that is geared to be uh, different in that it's not necessarily for the person who wants to digitize because it might be too complex and the whole lot, you know, they, there's a lot of people out there who never digitize and they don't want to. And the Doodler crosses that bridge because the way I assisted in engineering it, it does a lot of the, uh, the I guess, how can I put it? it? It does things kind of automatically without the user knowing it. As long as you follow some simple rules that I give you about joining to anchors and how you draw and continue things, it's just a really fun freehand tool. So my whole intent, because I am a Hatch reseller and I love the Hatch program, is I did not want to come out with a program that was going to compete with anything that Hatch or any other programs that you own already do. That, that is something, because we teach education on 11 different platforms. The Doodler is not a digitizer. You can edit your Doodle designs, but you can't edit outside formats. So there, there's a, a difference between the two. If you do take a look at our uh, Doodle group and you see the incredible stuff that we've created, it is very, very artistic because that's why the software was developed. Right. You want to drive an automatic car or you want to have a manual? Manual car. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they do. Actually, I think one person in our groups, they, uh, one of our groups, they asked it and one gentleman explained it in a way that I thought was perfect. He sort of said the Doodler kind of fills a bit of a void and enhances the other programs. Right. He was talking about Hatch, but it's not necessarily replacing anything. It's just another tool to give you a different artistic medium. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you confirm when you're using branches, is it uh, similar for welds? Like when would you use uh, welding? Branching welding is completely welding? different because welding will just take all of the objects and it will weld them together and give you one uniform stitch angle and then you have to go in and add angles and do all that kind of stuff and it, it doesn't necessarily react in the same way that branching does at all branching will look at each individual piece how you've engineered the inclination points and when it does recalculate it at one piece it recalculates the object but it keeps all of the i guess identifiable uh, stitch directions, and it doesn't just weld things together. It keeps the original shapes uniformed. Okay. Can you use the design doodler with Hatch? Uh, I mean, yes, as an accompanying partnership. Uh, the, way the, the way Hatch works is Hatch has the EMB platform, which is proprietary to Hatch, and you can do incredible things with that EMB uh, file format. But if you take that EMB file and you give it to somebody who has Floriani software, they can't do anything with the EMB file because it's not native to their software. You need a, a WAF or a WAF file if you have Floriani because that's its native file format. The Doodler is the same in that it has its own file native file format called JDX, which is 
John Deere, which is kind of cool because I have a format with my initials in it. But and Jennifer's looking at me rolling her eyes because I've only no, said that how many times? Deere. Oh, it's Jennifer Deere. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or James Deere or Jesse Deere. Okay. So anyways. Sorry, Bethany. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, Beth. Uh, I wanted to name you Jessica. I just want you to know. Okay. Anyways, uh, the uh, but your mother's always right. So it was you had the right name. But anyways, um, the each software program has its own proprietary format that allows you to edit it. So if you create something in the Doodler and you want to edit it, you would edit within the Doodler JDX format, and then you would save it out as a PDS, bring it into Hatch or Floriani or Stitch Artist or whatever program you own, and you could add other elements, edit the design, you know, so to speak, like other elements of the design, add lettering, all that good stuff. That kind of ties into another question where a lady is asking, is it possible to edit purchase fonts in a PES format with Hatch? Uh, yes and no. Uh, what Hatch does, like many other programs, is it will look at an expanded file format like a PES file. And it's not native to the software, but it will look at it and it will re uh engineer mathematically the lines and objects and try to recreate the inclination points as best as it can. But the idea is, give you an example, if a O on a letter, which is circular, would have a normally, as far as inclinations, four points, 12, three, six, and nine. So that would have like 12, three, six, and nine. Those are the four inclination points that were used to make that perfect circle when you have a EMB file format, you'll see four points as far as directions or inclinations. When you take a PES file uh, and you bring it into another program, Hatch or any other, and it re-engineers that object, you no longer will have four different hands of the clock. You'll probably have every single second. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's not as friendly to edit because it tries its best to recreate something that is, you know, no longer, it's like vector and, uh, you know, a raster image. One vector is lines, points that create it. A raster image is dots per inch. You have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of dots to create that image. Uh, could you please lay out the changes that you would do on the design if that was for caps? If this was for caps? Mm -hmm. uh, if this was for a cap, actually, I'm just trying to, let me get rid of this real quick bring this full screen and I got to go back to the other one so that we can see it. If this were for a cap, uh, I, you know, strangely enough, I might not change much because I might start on this one and do this piece first and then do this piece second and then do this piece third and then go around. But usually for baseball hats, a design has a bottom up center out mentality. You always start closest to where the peak meets the crown because that's where it is kind of held in on your cap frame. And you try to move up from that and push out towards the crown so that you don't start getting movement going either direction. And then you try to have your objects go from the center seam out to either side. So it's a little bit of re-engineering if you're going to do something, but this is a really simple design. I don't think you'd have to do much to it, to be honest. Okay. Okay. Uh, should I show a couple more things right now real quick? Sure. And I'll hit mm -hmm. some more questions because we are running short on time. I don't want this to go on forever. But if you guys are having fun, let should me we, know. Should uh, we uh, get the winter stuff? Is that coming up? It's coming up pretty okay. soon. But I'll just show everybody the finished sample. This is pretty much identical to what I created. And James, did you have anything you needed to add? Are you hungry? Is that what the problem is? Okay, James hasn't had dinner yet. So we have to make, we're on a time schedule here. Because James might get a little hangry on us. Uh, the difference between red work and branching quickly? Uh, branching will look at an object, and if you choose a start and a stop, it will sort of uh, re-engineer it exactly the way it wants. Uh, sorry, uh, that is for branching. Red work will you use with a running stitch, and it will give you exactly two passes in a design, because a red work design has two passes of thread only. Right, like so, a back and yeah, a fourth. Like a back and a fourth. So there's always a start and a stop, start and a stop. And it's pretty amazing how it you know goes through complex shapes. So here is the design done. And if I do hide this for a second, just so you can see, this is what I love about the Mylar designs. And hide this one on screen. Okay. 
hopefully we'll see that. But can you see that kind of shine in there as it's changing? Is that going? Okay, I'm looking over here, it's starting to come up. But the mylar actually goes right through there and it is with the 1.2 millimeter stitch length. You can actually launder this, it launders pretty well. This design we already have converted and we are putting up as a free download. How did we do that, James? Do you remember? How we how is this up as a free download? Is it in a link to our free design blog? Okay, there is a link to our free design blog that the kids are going to put up in this uh, feed. So you can download this free design. And that's just a cool little thing in appreciation for you guys joining us today. But that design is finished and all sewed out. On the mention of Mylar, does Mylar tear easily or more easily and crispy, crispily than what the dollar store cellophane would? Uh, yeah, I mean, we do have a product and Mylar is a, uh, a, a, I guess a trademarked product. So when I say Mylar, I actually didn't use Mylar. I use like a, a sparkle sheet, uh, you know, and we do have that on our site and it does actually tear away really nicely and doesn't cause really any issues. And there's other companies that sell it as well. So uh, buy it from an embroidery supplier and you'll probably have better results than some of the dollar store. That's like buying 3D foam at a dollar store compared to buying the foam from an embroidery supplier. The results are generally better with products that are more de designed for the purpose. On the mention of foam, if somebody wants to get better at digitizing 3D uh, foam for hats is the 3d puffy foam digitizing lesson just for our products uh we do have a lesson don't we james i think yeah we, we do. do and it is a generic lesson and it teaches you how to uh, cap the ends how to pinch the ends i give the underlay values i give the density values i give a bunch of examples i i do remember that it was a couple years ago now that we did that whole uh -huh. series but i did a whole whole bunch of different effects with foam and if you watch it, actually, foam is the reason why I'm sitting here today, because I did a foam hat in 1998 that won a grand prize with EMB magazine that uh, at the time, nobody had ever done anything like it before. It was three layers of foam, and it kind of set my uh, educational career in motion. So that was a long time ago now. Okay, okay I'm going to show a couple more slides okay. real quick. Okay, awesome. Just so you guys know, we have St. Patrick's Day coming up in like a month's time. And if you do go to our site, we do have all of our St. Patrick's Day designs, and there are over 100 of them on our site, uh, all for 25% off. The cute little kid that's there does not come with it. It's, uh, it's Eli. Can you see him? I okay. can't. Well, come here closer, Jen. Come here and look. <laughs> on the, okay. Uh, anyway, that's, that's my middle grandson, so that's Eli. And we do have some new designs that we've done for this uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day. And they are actually on the site right now for 25% off. And they are kind of really cool. I have all the stitch outs here, but I don't think I'll go through them all because uh, they're, they're kind of normal designs, but they're great for t-shirts and sweatshirts and give some of the festive uh, spirit of it. You know, like, uh, I guess, uh, let's get ready to stumble. That would be something that some of you younger people might do out there. But this one was my favorite one that I did, and I will show you the stitch out. This is the same type of artwork. Everybody is still in love with gnomes, so we need to have St. Patrick's gnomes. And this one is a design that is this big. And actually, if you're a gnome lover, if give you're us a gnome arts. lover, yeah, this is definitely for you gnome lovers out there. Let's show you this design. But there he is. So again, lots and lots of detail. They, we are working with an incredible artist that has been giving us all this type of style of artwork, and we just love it. Just so you know, this was the original sew out. Here there is a little bit of registration issue. I am by no means perfect, even after all these years of digitizing. And Jennifer, am I perfect? <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, absolutely not. The so on a, on a complex design <laughs> like this, I did run a sample and I had to edit some of the registration issues because doing a lot of fills and detailed designs without having too many color changes, but not too few, you know, it's just, it's one of those even balances where you uh, have a little bit of a mind of its own, but that is a really, really fun, cool design. And that's the one we are going to give away for free. So if you would like to have this cute little, what, what do we call him? It was like a, 
a pickup gnome St. Patrick's Day. I forget what we actually named the uh, design, but if you would like to win that St. Patrick's Day gnomes on the pickup truck, just type in oh, lucky. That's great. Okay. So type in the word lucky and we will announce a couple winners in a couple of minutes. One from Facebook and one from yep. YouTube. Actually, let's do two and two. Okay. Okay. So two and two, we'll give uh, four of them away. So type in lucky and uh, James and Jesse will let us know who is lucky. Okay. Uh, Maybe had a good explanation of the outside fonts when you bring them into a different software. Okay. She said uh, it's similar to having a design file, not a font file. That is true. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, is, uh, there is big differences between fonts. I mean, there's a lot of fonts for sale on sites and they are stitch file fonts. And then you try to resize them and you run into all kinds of issues. Uh, and then there's native file format, format fonts. And, you know, Hatch has their native file format. Floriani has theirs and Brilliance has theirs. They all have a native and those will always resize much better than a stitch file font will depending on your software program. And keep in mind, you know, Hatch obviously is a great platform and I have uh, literally digitized almost a thousand fonts at this point. I, I actually told, or I didn't tell, I asked Jesse if I should start slowing down now because I'm at like 948 or something that are ready. And uh, he said, yeah, you might as well stop. And I thought, I got to hit a thousand. I just, I have to, cause that's, a, that's the number. So anyways, there's some more coming, but I might slow down on the fonts because we have a thousand of them to choose from. Which is fantastic. Yep. Okay. What fabric are you using on the wall art behind you? Uh, the fabric on the wall art for the most part is all canvas, like just a canvas material. I go there and find the, you know, stuff that's on sale. I try to get stuff with uh, not a ton of stretch to it, you know, like it's a little more stable, but anytime I'm doing embroidery art pieces, I will try to find canvas. We do sew a lot of our samples on uh, acrylic felt just because it's easy to do and we know it's, you know, gonna, gonna run uh, fairly easily. But sometimes if I'm doing a design for a baseball hat and I know what's going on a hat, you should sample that on a baseball hat if you wanna get the true results or a golf shirt, you wanna sample on golf shirts if that is the desired, uh, you know, product that you know it's gonna go on. Always do samples on what you know it's gonna be sewn on if you have that availability. Right. And yeah. a great place if you're looking for materials to yep. sample is the thrift shop. Yeah, actually, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Like don't, don't throw away your old clothes and stuff. I mean, it, we really want to keep it out of landfills anyways, you know, repurpose it and reuse it. And uh, if you can sell your samples on it, if you can do raw appliques with it, I mean, anything, just save that material and have fun with it. It's, okay. it's kind of like an art project. So if, if any of you are thinking about Hatch and you don't want to pull the trigger, they do have a, a free 30 day trial that actually allows you to export designs and uh, you know, the sales on until the 20th. So you have a little bit of time to play with it and try it. You can download that through our site and we do have our free uh, hatch digitizing challenge. I've always said that, uh, you know, uh, software makes no sense unless you're given some instructions on how to use it. Right. So this will give you the lessons that we give you are the designs that you see in the corner and we will show you interactively how to create these within the demo version. So you have nothing to lose in reality. And then, as I've said before, regardless of your software program, I think every embroiderer should download our 101 video course and cheat sheet because this will, without going into a ton of detail, give you all of the basic theory of how designs are created and what a running stitch is, a satin stitch, what density is, what pathing is, what underlay is, what pull compensation is. So at least you have an idea, you know, of what you're, you're doing. So that is a uh, thing. So back to the who wants to win. Do we have some winners? Or do we have any more questions while we're waiting for the winners? We have some winners. And one question uh, with the 3D Puff Advanced class that you're offering, uh, is, is it different from your old school lesson? Uh, probably. The, the, the new one that we shot, it would be very different from the original uh, part that I did for foam that was uh, in the old creative digitizing course. That's the eight hours of education that comes with our Digitizer's Dream course. So this is a lot more content, probably a lot of the same 
principles as far as the uh, densities and underlays and some of the things that I say will be the same, but it is more interactive in that we give you more practical things to work with and sewn files so that you can see the results okay. and call them into your software. Okay, I think we have the names. The cheat sheet, was that the free cheat yep, sheet? Yep, it's a free cheat I sheet. I think you so. the word free in there. Oh, okay. Well, well it, no, it's there. It's it's big. Okay. It's free right in the well, center. Well, I can't see it. I okay. Well, if you just work. come over here, I, I would be happy. And the winners are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Facebook, we have Jackie Lance. So congratulations, Jackie. Congratulations. And uh, Aileen Chadwick Hornback. So hopefully I pronounced that right. Congratulations, Aileen. And if you could email into contact at embroiderylegacy.com, Leanne will set you up with your free design. And the YouTube winners that we have are Sonny Ben, so congratulations, and Elaine Budner, so congratulations. Congratulations, guys. Yeah, so again, contact at embroiderylegacy.com awesome, for Sonny awesome. and Elaine. And uh, also, this was a, about Hatch, but as an accompanying product, if anybody is interested, the, uh, the Design Doodler is also on sale for $40 off right now. So if you want to check that out and if you want to, uh, you know, ask to become part of our Design Doodler Facebook group, I think we have like 3,100 people in there now, which is awesome. But you can see some of the creative work that we've done. Please join us on social media. Subscribe to our, our YouTube channel. Actually, uh, we just hit over uh, 59,000 subscribers. And we're really close to 60, so tell all your friends. I know James, what do you want to hit? What's your big number? 100,000. Yeah, James wants 100,000 because that's his baby. And if he hits 100,000, then he gets that really cool plaque that he gets to put right beside his desk there. So that's, that's what our goal is uh, for that. Uh, so anyways, I think that's about it. Any other questions, Jennifer, dear? I don't see any other questions questions well, I, but i could have missed some but i appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedule and uh we'll be back in a couple weeks we've got some really cool fun stuff coming up i know easter's coming yep no i was just gonna say in the sale for hatch is on until the, until the 20th. 20th yeah and the doodler is on until the 20th and uh i i jennifer you had asked me what i wanted for valentine's day and i didn't really have anything that i wanted well, i've decided what i want i'd like you to come here and give me a kiss right here <laughs> <laughs> okay guess i'm not getting anything for valentine's day this year so you got it okay <laughs> you <laughs> nice. already got your gift <laughs> it's not that kind of show yet <laughs> anyways uh thank you guys for joining us uh, we really appreciate it we appreciate you guys and any questions you have just uh join one of our groups ask them uh, we have incredible admins jennifer and i are on there most days uh most Mo evenings, most weekends. evenings, all that good stuff. So we, we try to help out as much as we can. And we have great admins. Yes, we do. We have incredible admins. So anyways, thank you, everyone. And we will see you next time. Thanks for joining us.